This is episode five of Real Shift Radio with special guest Taylor Conroy. Are you ready for the shift? Are you ready for security, balance, and freedom to do the things that you want to do? It all starts with the shift. My name is Dominic Labriola. I'm a real estate broker and developer, and each week I sit down to speak with the most inspiring people in the real estate industry to bring you stories of shift, successes, challenges, aha moments, and overall best practices to help you live your best life. This is Real Shift Radio. Welcome back to Real Shift Radio Shifters. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to say that I was very honored and humbled to have been asked by my friend Alex Kuhn to be a guest on his self-made podcast. I've gotten some really nice phone calls this week and some wonderful posts on Facebook telling me that you enjoyed the episode. So for that, I want to say thank you, listeners, and thank you, Alex, for asking me to join you in your studio. If you haven't listened yet, check the episode out at CoachAlexKuhn.com. I'll also link up to the episode in this show's notes. I really opened up to Alex during our conversation and shared some of the challenges I've faced, from financial ruin to weight gain and how I've overcome that. The theme of the show is about claiming your goodness, which is something I think is key to discovering fulfillment and finding happiness in your life. We also talk about my inspiration behind starting this program. I really believe bringing you Real Shift Radio is a part of my greater purpose and service to this world, and I hope you're starting to feel that sense of purpose. So with that said, I want to jump right into episode five. Some of you may already know Taylor Conroy from his incredibly inspiring TEDx talk, How to Build a School in Three Hours. That's where I first learned about him, at least. Taylor is a former top producing realtor and real estate company owner but he's currently working on a fundraising platform he founded after a trip to Kenya. This man is truly doing good things for the world through his company, Change Heroes. I think this episode is packed with amazing tips that you're going to love. Taylor's literally one of the inspirations behind Real Shift Radio, and I'm so honored to bring you his story. So let's get to it. Thank you, Taylor Conroy. Thanks for joining me for Real Shift Radio. Thank you, Dial Dominic. (laughs) So... Condo Conroy was your nickname back in the day, and uh, and I first learned about you after reading, or actually after watching your TED talk about how to build a school. And I reached out to you a few years ago. We became friends back then, and I wanted to bring you on the podcast because you are doing some really interesting things, and uh, and I'm hoping that you'll share a lot of your path from real estate and then now what you're doing in your business, Change Heroes. So so tell me first, since it is a show rooted in real estate, um, tell me about how you got into the real estate industry. Sure. So, you know what? My entry into real estate was interesting. I was I was working full time as a professional firefighter. Uh, I was probably 23 at the time, and was starting to read a bunch of books like Think and Grow Rich, Rich Dad Poor Dad, uh, Richest Man in Babylon, other things with rich in the title. Because I was 23, full of piss and vinegar, wanted to make um, more money than I was making at the fire hall. So I was trying to research, you know. Um, other ways of bringing in income and learning about passive income and yada yada. I all I all I had was a you know uh, a squeaked by high school education. Um, I never went to post secondary school or anything like that. So I, so I was reading these books to learn how to make money without going to school, which turns out um, was a good idea because I think going to school I'm not maybe I'm just not a, not necessarily a big advocate for uh, post secondary education if you're looking to you know build um, uh, wealth. Let's say so. Uh, read all these books, realized, I, read one, I remember reading one that said 90% of the world's millionaires are millionaires through real estate. And, and I was like, okay, well, done, then I'll just do real estate. And, and I thought to myself, who, uh, would, who knows the most about real estate? And I thought, probably realtors. So I literally just went home that day and ordered the course, and I was like, oh, I'll just become a realtor on the side from firefighting. Um, got, did my course quickly, um, kind of copied other people's answers to get through it, and... 
started started selling real estate on the side on my four days off from the fire hall and got so obsessed with it that I ended up a year later after doing both uh, for about a year I quit firefighting and started to do uh, real estate full time. Hmm. So you built a large team and tell me how that process kind of came to be where you you were working independently initially I'd assume. Yeah. So yeah. So I started out. Actually, you know what? I brought on a partner really soon because I was firefighting. Mm. So after six months in the business, I was like, it's impossible to work forty-eight hours a week at the fire hall and do this business on the side. I, I brought on a partner and I said, look, if you can just you know build the website, um, take care of our backend systems, you do the paperwork, I'll just go out and sell. If you can just let me go out and sell, if that's all I do every day, I will split all my commissions with you 50-50. Mm -hmm. and he said, sounds like a deal to me. Um, we partnered up and, and that's how it worked. I just immersed myself in sales books by you know Brian Tracy and Zig Ziglar and um, what was it, Floyd Wickman's, like what is that? The Sweat Hogs. Like old school, right? Yep. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny story. The first, the first and only CD that I, I think that I listened to of Floyd Wickman's was the, probably the first one he did is talking about Fizbo's. And it's like, you know, this is how you get business. You start calling people until someone says uh, that they're willing to buy or, sell their home, buy or sell a home. And so I did. I literally just sat down at a phone. I was like, oh, that makes, that's pretty simple. Um, I'll just keep calling people. And I, and I knew that cold calling would probably give me a tough skin, which is, is just kind of what I wanted. I wanted to get used to people saying no. I wanted to, you know, build up resilience to that. And um, so I literally would sit down. I would print off a whole bunch of phone numbers. And I would call until, and I would say, "Hey, this is <laughs> this is Taylor from Remax. Um, do you have thirty seconds?" And they go, "Yeah, sure." I'm like, "Well, uh, just wondering if you're looking to buy or sell a home." And this is, you know, this is old. This is like me wearing nothing but uh, what, what I was wearing at the time was like some Le Chateau um, suit. You know, I don't know if you guys have Le Chateau down there, but it's probably the cheapest place you could ever buy dress clothes. <laughs> Every all the collars looked like these big like seventies collars. The shirts would probably fall apart in a, in a in a strong wind, and the pants are just you know like John Travolta um, from Saturday Night Fever. And so I'm wearing this, and I only have one pair of dress pants because it's all I could afford. And so I didn't have any business, and I I drove a truck that had no reverse and was like all rusted out. So I would so I would park like two blocks away from all the showings okay. and or anyone that I would meet and there in my stupid. You can probably like me, da, 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 you know, <laughs> down the street in this terrible polyester outfit. Um, so yeah, long story short, started out independently, got a partner relatively quick, and then then just started realizing that you know leverage was where things were at in in real estate. And so we brought on an assistant, um, started getting obsessed with becoming really good at getting listings, and then brought on a buyer's agent, and then subsequently brought on more buyers agents and, and some listing agents, and uh, and built the team up from there. Mm -hmm. And then you guys started the condo group and became uh, your. Were you at your own company, or did you um, did you work for another firm at that time? Yeah. So that the way that that happened, the, the, the condo group, the specialization happened. Really, was we put out this flyer one time to a building that we had. My partner and I had sold sold a unit in, and my last name's Conroy, so it sounds like condo, and it was a condo building. So we. We started writing an ad. Oh yeah, we put up this flyer, and we, I just put my name as Condo Conroy, like almost as a joke. Mm -hmm. And and we started running ads in the paper that said Conroy's Condos, you know, and and I would just have the condo listings that I had, and uh, you know, saying this all out loud makes it sound a lot cheesier than I than I thought it was. And <laughs> and so we started running these ads, and then I walked walking through this building one day, and this this woman goes, "Hey, are you Condo Conroy?" And I was like. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. And she's like, well, can you come and look at my condo? I'm thinking about selling it. And, and, and then I get in, she's like, yeah, because you only you just specialize in condos, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that's, that's where it started. So I started calling myself Condo Conroy, and um, I, I realized that there was about 20,000 condos in the, in the town, city that I uh, lived in. No one was really specializing just in condos. And so I thought, you know, 20,000 condos, that's like a small town. Mm -hmm. All in this one within this one city, and I wanted to specialize the the market that I was in. It was we're talking two thousand six, so the market was still really really good. I knew that it was going to turn at some point, or I'd been told it was going to turn at some point. So I wanted to build a brand so that if it did turn, that I would be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so really focused on branding, 
condo with my face um, as much as possible. My license plate said condo. Our mail outs, if you were to actually count, our mail outs are like these little cards that are about, how big were they? Maybe three, in, three and a half inches high by seven inches wide. So kind of like a big kind of flyer type mail out mm -hmm. on card stock. And if you counted the, the number of times that it said condo on that piece of paper, it said it, said it 40 times. Wow. Now, for your condo, this is how fast we sell condos, condo condo, the condo group, blah, 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 blah. And so anyways, that's how the condo group started was, was branding myself condo condo, right? That was, at, and then we started, I started the condo group after I had parted ways with my partner. I had stopped working at the fire hall, didn't need a partner anymore, um, felt, felt it was best to kind of go out on my own and, and started quote unquote the condo group under, um, I think at the time it was under Remax, mm -hmm. you know, it was like in Remax because, you know, you've talked to broker owners and they're like, you never want to do this. It's tons of paperwork. It's, you got to get courses, you got to get trust accounts. And I just wanted to focus on selling. Yeah. So we just did it under Realist Remax. We, we found that we could still create a really good brand with it uh, while, while fitting with Remax guidelines. And then subsequently after that, we still wanted to be able to brand a little bit heavier without having the Remax sign, you know, the red, white, and blue yeah. on it. So, so we moved to a small boutique brokerage that said, you do whatever you want with your signs. Just make sure that they're legal. Sure. Um, and, you know, in, in real, reality, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine reminiscing about real estate the other day and, and saying that I think that you should always be at the point where you're like pushing the boundaries of what is, you know, you know, what is actually legally, what you're legally able to do. Your signs should be bigger than they should be. Your, your mail is... You know what I mean? Like everything should be as much as humanly possible. Um, you know, but that's, I don't know, maybe that's just me. <laughs> so how did you start kind of realizing that real estate wasn't your end all? Um, you know what? I'm going to be super honest. Dominic and say that I never resonated with realtors. I never going to group, going to the, the parties and the shindigs and stuff. I was like, ugh, like these, I don't know. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm, I don't feel, I don't feel like I fit in. I, I didn't feel like I fit in in that crew. I actually, to tell you the truth, I never actually um, resonated with the term Taylor, you're a realtor. I, you know, I, what I really liked about real estate was the business. I really liked building something that, um, that could, the thought of running, of building something that could run without you. That's why we started calling it the Conroy Group and not the Taylor Conroy Group or Condo Conroy Group or anything like that, was in an effort to slowly remove myself from business in an effort to be able to travel more, to travel and have like a really free kind of lifestyle. And so that's what the Conroy Group was for. That's why it was formed, the Conroy Group, was, was to enable me to at some point leave um, so that I could travel and, and do other things that I wanted to do. Um, philanthropy was not on the top of my mind when I first started the Conroy Group. But uh, I did end up going on a trip to um, Uganda and Kenya in 2009. So I'd been in real estate for about four years. Mm -hmm. And I, I went there because I had saved up some money. I think I'd saved up about $5,000 uh, in, in my charity account. And what I mean by that is I would always take 10% of my income and put it towards uh, charity. You know, And it's not, not from a religious standpoint or anything like that, but just something that I... It was actually from a, from a business standpoint of, of knowing that money has to flow. There has, they can't, you know, like the Dead Sea is the, is the Dead Sea because there's nothing coming in, there's nothing going out. It's just sitting there full of salt, you're not going anywhere, so it's dead. No life, just full of salt. Whereas a typical ocean is flow. There's rivers coming out of, there's just like a, a circle that happens. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is with money. Is there has to be a flow to it. So you have to be giving away, not just trying to hoard and accumulate. And so... I started giving away 10% of my income before I even had, you know, that was at the fire hall. Then it translated into real estate. Um, and I started making good money in real estate when the market was great um, and we were hustling away. And um, so I started seeing there was more and more money accumulating in my charity account. Ended up wanting to see where that money would go. Went to Africa, um, to Kenya, and Uganda, and, and Egypt to actually checked out a bunch of different programs that were happening there. Found one that I was really, um, you know, really resonated with. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to tell you the truth, I was just like, I was changed. I was, um, I started looking at trying to sell a whole bunch more condos and buy a nicer truck or buy a nicer vehicle as completely empty. And, and I started even resonating even less with the people that I was doing business with mm. thinking, you know, that the stuff that we stress out about as realtors, um, is fucking nothing compared to, you know, obviously what's happening in the world in, 
the world today, for example, what's happening in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak. You know, whereas you know, I was stressing out about selling 10, 10 condos a month and making, you know, trying to make a million dollars a year or whatever it was and giving away 10% of that. That's nice. That's a nice start, I think, um, to give away 10% of your money. I think it's great. But at the end of the day, you know, you, Dominic, you're a super, you know, passionate, uh, high energy entrepreneurial guy. The, your money is great to go towards good causes, but imagine your entrepreneurial spirit, your creativity, your energy channeled towards something you know, that's going to benefit the world in a really, really big way. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean, I don't mean for a second that you drop everything and go work for a nonprofit and make $30,000 a year. What I mean is what I started getting passionate about is making money while doing good because you need to make money. Money has to be flowing to these nonprofits um, and you need to make money to be able to build an organization big enough so that you can actually tackle the really big problems of the world. So I wasn't interested, I know I'm rambling your ear off now, but I wasn't interested in, in starting a nonprofit um, where I was going to be begging people for money. I wanted to do something that would do massive good where my business was doing good and I wanted to make a significant amount of money doing it because I knew that all the money that I made doing it would get reinvested into doing more social good initiatives. Mm -hmm. So, so probably like maybe dovetail into what you maybe you were going to ask next, which is about Change Heroes. So, you know, Change Heroes, we are a fundraising platform. You know, we're not a nonprofit. We're a for-profit social enterprise. And in that, we raise money, we give it to nonprofits, whether we're building schools, water projects, community centers, volunteer travel, anti-sex trafficking work in Cambodia, for example, or, you know, funding the efforts on the ground uh, fighting the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. We raise money for nonprofits. And because we do, we've innovated this platform that enables anyone to raise $10,000 in as little as a day. And I always thought if I, can, if I can build something that is so high value that just doesn't exist in the world today, mm -hmm. then I can charge you know, a significant amount of money to do it or more than the industry average to do it and therefore I'll make more money that I can pour back into the platform raise more money for nonprofits, make more money, pour it back to the platform, and that is my, you know, my go-to. And so to look at the contrast between when I was in real estate, I had this beautiful house by the ocean, 100-year-old house, all been rented, it was gorgeous, it was amazing, had a new truck, more, like fast R6 Yamaha, crotch rocket, which was ridiculous, which I crashed like three times, and <laughs> I'm not dead. And I could barely drive a, a dirt bike. Yeah, I'll take the fastest bike you have, please. And, uh, and... <laughs> You know, fully furnished, all my furniture was beautiful, everything was wonderful, and, and I know how I felt at that point in my life, and now I'm sitting in my office, and it's really funny because I'm in my office, yet 20 feet away is where I sleep. I've got a foamy on the floor in one of our open rooms, uh, the comforter that's kind of half-assed, and uh, which is all borrowed, and all the stuff, <laughs> everything, everything I own could fit into two suitcases, but I can't put into words how exponentially more fulfilled, let's say, that I am now compared to then. You know, I can pick up, I can go and do what I want to do, and, and I'm here where every single day, like right from here I'm looking at, you know, a wall that's, that's uh, the entryway of our office space, and it's got all these pictures of people that have used our platform to raise $10,000. Mm. They raised a grant for schools, and like I said, libraries, real scholarships, you know, a ton of different things, and I know that all of their lives are totally changed because they've realized that they can make an exponential amount of difference by sitting at their freaking laptop, you know, making some videos for friends, which is what we do through our platform, and, and raising $10,000 to impact the lives of, you know, thousands of people on the other side of the world. And I will stop rambling now. Mm. So it takes a lot of people to achieve something like this. What kind of people are you bringing into your life who, who can help you to build something big like this? Yeah, you know, it's, that's a funny question because I was thinking that yesterday. I was on you know, back to back calls all day and, and meetings and same as today and thinking, man, the amount of people, the amount of people that you have to correspond with, you know, to, to get anything done is absolutely exponential. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So, for example, if, if I was to say like the different chunks of people, I really like the number three. So there are probably three chunks of people. One, um, the fuel, you know, behind Change Heroes at the moment, we're, we're a tech startup, right? We've got 10, 10 staff, um, uh, and, and we, we don't pay nonprofit wages. We pay a little bit more than nonprofit wages so that people, you know, can make what they're, what they're worth. And, uh, and so we've got a decent burn rate. And so to fund, this, to fund our social enterprise, or tech, this tech startup, we've taken on investment. So we've got 16 investors 
um, that range from a 30-year venture capitalist to a guy in private equity to you know a founder of um, a really cool beverage company that you would see if you went into all, all the Whole Foods mm. to mm. you know a really good friend of mine who just believes in me. You know, so, awesome. so this massive range of, of investors, of incredible people that have jumped on board um, to fund Change Heroes to get to profitability, and and then we've got that's the fuel, and then the group that we have that's working with us today ranges from um, a 16 year old intern um, who's doing who is incredible. She's a genius named Kari Heng who uh, does lots of our follow up for our past campaign runners. We've got a whole bunch of early 20s. People that have used the platform were so impacted by it that they're like, you know, they've literally quit their jobs and come to work for us um, for less than what they were making at their jobs. Like one, one guy, Evan, who's in the other room, um, did a campaign when he was 22, raised $10,000 um, to build a schoolhouse in Kenya. We actually flew him to to Kenya and introduced him to the people that he was whose lives he was impacting, which is incredible. And we filmed all of it, uh, which is beautiful. We, we, we wanted to, you know, they, yeah, isn't it wonderful? Yeah. Yeah, so Evan's in the other room, and he's he basically is living here. He's from Boston. Um, he left his job at I think it was J.P. Morgan. Wow, I think it was J.P. Morgan to, to come and to come and work here. And and the same thing for Rianne, moved over here from Victoria, who has also had another writing job, came to work with us. And you know, everyone, it, to be honest, it's like a magnet. Like it's like when you're doing something you're so so passionate about, it's like ridiculous the people that have that have come into play. And before talking to you, talking to this guy who's got a massive company, he's just about to get it. It's just, it's actually in the process, it has been acquired technically by IBM and uh, for many kajillions of dollars. And uh, and he, you know, in our second phone call, he's just like, you know what, I really love what you're doing. I've looked through the deck, I've looked through all, all your financials. He's like, I'm in, I'm into, I want to advise as much as possible, I'm in to invest. And, you know, let's meet up in New York when we're both there next and let's, and let's do this. Wow. Um, so and those are my, you know, those are obviously my favorite calls. You know, it just comes together like this. And so, yeah. Long story short, you know, just amazing people. I've got about a hundred other stories of people that have come in, and it's always, basically, always unsolicited. You know, people will come up and be like, "I want to do all of your PR for free." I'm like, oh, okay. Or after I did a talk in New York, maybe two months ago, a guy comes up, he's like, "Hey, I'm a startup lawyer. I'm going to do all your legal work pro bono." Wow. And I was like, that, "That would be incredible. Thank you." Um, and he is doing it. He's great. So. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a slew of amazing different people. I've met more people doing this than I have in my, the other thirty years of my life combined, um, and some really amazing people come aboard. And now I'm talking to you. Are yeah. You <laughs> well, thank you. So, what kind of challenges have you faced through this process? Dude. Ugh, I don't even know where to start. Like the, you have the challenge. The thing is, running a social enterprise, you have the challenges of a for-profit company that that you would have. In that, you got to get to profitability. You need to go out and raise capital to you know to support your team. Um, you need to make partnerships. You need to sign paperwork. You know, not everything's like a, a dream. Like sometimes it looks like on on social media, people are saying all the time, they're like, "Wow, it looks like Change Heroes is just magical." And I'm like, yeah, I, I guess so. Probably because I'm not posting saying, stayed up today and worked 24 hours straight and uh, don't have time for sleep and this partnership just fell apart and blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, you have all the, all the challenges that you would have in a for-profit company. All the, uh, you know, I, actually I should preface that and say it is a lot, a lot more flow than, uh, than a typical for-profit company in my experience. You know, the amount of things kind of just magically coming together are quite incredible, yet there still are challenges. You know, it's what I find is that it's, Change Heroes is like this massive growth machine for me personally. It's always stretching. It's always stretching what I'm comfortable with, like what my comfort zone is. And a good example of that is like the very beginning of Change Heroes was while I was still in real estate, someone recommended me, or my girlfriend at the time, um, recommended me to do a TEDx talk. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, oh, wow. I that, thought that would be an amazing experience, a uh, really a good opportunity. Had never done a Change Heroes campaign before, but I really wanted to talk about it. I had the idea, and I was like, I got it. Yeah, so that video that you watched, but at the time when I got accepted to do that TEDx talk, I had never done a campaign before. Oh, wow. But I wrote the speech like I had already done the campaign mm -hmm. and just vowed to do them before the speech. And so did. Did a campaign. It worked. Raised $10,000 with my friends. Um, did the talk on it. That was my first ever speaking experience. Yeah. Uh, 
and I practiced, man, I was like, I would wake up almost on the verge of throwing up every day because <laughs> I was so nervous for that talk and did the talk. It was, it went amazingly well. I was so happy with it that I didn't screw up. And, you know, if I would have gotten, if one person in the audience would have waved at me, I would have totally got flustered and got red and sweated and been sweating and, and probably, you know, run off the stage crying, but luckily no one did. Um, so that talk went well. And the next, and right after that, I spread that talk to, to some people. I got a, uh, an email from a woman and said, Hey, I'm, I, uh, I, I'm from Harvard and I saw your TEDx talk and we would like you to come and be the keynote speaker at, um, the biggest conference that we put on all year. And I'm like, Oh, oh boy. You know, like I just gotten over feeling nervous about the TEDx talk. Now they want me to come and speak at Harvard. I've got like, like I said, barely squeaked through high school. And I'm super nervous in, in front of people that have hard or hard degrees of anyways, <laughs> let alone speaking in front of hundreds and hundreds of them for my second ever speech. Mm. And I was, so that put, I mean, that put tons of strain on, I know that all sounds like, wow, that's amazing. But the, you know, your comfort level during that, like I was stretched as a person, like it was mm. so stressful for six months leading up to that talk, finished the talk, didn't even get off the stage. And this woman comes up and she's like, Hey, I want you to come and speak at the United Nations. And I was like, Fuck! <laughs> I just, I just, oh, I was so nervous for this talk, and I was so happy it was over. But yes, of course, I will do what I would love to, you know. So I guess you know that's it's fun. That's an example, I guess, Dominic, of the challenge because you're always stressed out. But it's an amazing challenge. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you know, I'm not going to complain about. It. Oh no, you have to speak at you know, Harvard. You know, it was an incredible experience. But you know, with fast growth in a positive way. It just, you know, kind of pulls you in all directions as well, um, in a in a challenging way as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it was a, it, it's been a trip. And so yeah, to sort of answer your question, the challenges, tons of challenges. And I tell you, to honest truth, I woke up this morning totally stressed out, um, and I never wake up stressed out. I woke up like my heart was racing, my chest was like tight. I was like, what is happening right now? Usually I'm super chill, meditate, Reiki guy, mm -hmm. but. Uh, but I got up and, you know, we've, it's because stuff is going so fast. Again, I'm super stretched comfort zone wise because stuff is going so well. It is just, you know, tripping me out and I feel like I'm on the verge of a heart attack. Yeah. But, but at the same time, I'm not going to stop because it's, no. you know, it's all good stuff. Two questions to that. So first of all, you, you mentioned meditation. I'd, I'd like you to get into your daily practice and your routine. Sure. Sure. Um, so I wake, okay, so it's, I call it, it's called RPM, rise, pee, meditate. So rise, get out of bed, take a pee, you know, have a drink of water, because obviously, I don't know about you, but I always pee when I wake up, and then, uh, and then sit down and meditate, and that's, that's the only way that I've found to make sure that you do meditate, because if you go, oh, I'll do it later, or I'll, you know, I'll do it in 10 minutes, whatever, your day gets away on you, and you just won't do it. And so for the last, I don't know, probably for the last four years, I've meditated you know, right when I got up, got up, I'm guessing like nine out of 10 days, there's, you know, the very odd day that I'm, you know, somewhere else that, uh, that it doesn't happen, but it'll happen later in the day for sure. So my meditation practice is really, really important to me. Um, and people usually ask, you know, like, what do you use guided meditations or whatever next? Um, this morning was just like a totally silent, uh, meditation. Sometimes I'll have some kind of gong music in the background. Sometimes it'll be a guided meditation, depending on how, if I'm stressed out or not. Uh, but typically it's just like sitting in bed up against the headboard, back straight, you know, cross legs. I can't do lotus position because I've got tight hips and, uh, um, yeah, that's the practice. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, oh yeah, and then routine, then I would get up, have some water. Um, I drink a lot of water and, and then get into the day. I, I try to make sure that my list is done for the day before I check emails, then go through emails, make sure that, you know, to start the day off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to have zero inbox. It's a bit of an obsession of mine and I get stressed out if I don't. Um, and then go through the day. The typical day is like back to back. Every meeting is about a half hour. Um, and I'll have, I don't know, between last Monday and last Wednesday, we had like 35 back to back calls, wow. which was, you know, nuts, but wonderful. That's, you know, pound through it, eat lots of salads, eat green juices. I've probably had two, two juices or smoothies today and some salad and you know, because that kind of keeps you, I don't know, for me anyways, if I have like a big meal, then it slows me down. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, this stuff kind of keeps me in a good mood and high energy. Eat tons of avocados with honey. That's a bit of an obsession. <laughs> I think I have like four today. I don't think that's healthy. 
But uh, <laughs> you, yeah, you so can that's... never overdo avocados. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, actually, you're probably right because if you could, I would have done it. Uh, and then, you know, depending on what we're doing, then typically lately I'm working till ten o'clock at night and then just going to bed. Um, that's got to take a break soon. We're going. We're, then I'll just go on a trip and do some traveling and do some mm -hmm. speaking and stuff like that. Um, so, but that's the, the typical routine. Okay. Second part to that question: When you wake up on a day like today, where your heart's beating and you're yeah. you're stressed, how do you shift out of that? Yeah. So, well, today for me, it's always it's meditation and trying to just keep breathing deeply. Um, and that um, accompanied with being very clear on where on what I want and where I want to go, because this this is actually this is kind of a good um, uh, what do you call it? contrast. When I was in real estate, I was really into saying this is what I want. You know, I want this type of girlfriend, and I want this type of house, and this type of car, and this and this is how much money I want in my bank account, for example. And it'd always be coming from a, from a point of this is what I want. This is and in reality, if you look deeper, what I'm really saying is this is what I think will make me happy, mm -hmm. is these things. And in real estate, I was really good at getting what I wanted in, in a way of like, you know, however you want to say it, vibrationally, law of attraction, whatever, you know, of, of having a vision board and saying, this is what I want. I want this office with this view and this ocean side house or whatever it is. And you get all these things. And then the next step is you're going to want something else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a pattern to want something else. And so... The difference between that and now is, is in however fluffy or spiritual it sounds, is, is in my meditation practices, continually asking, what does the universe want me to do? You know, like what, literally, like, to tell me what you want me to do. Um, what is my highest and best use? What is my most service to the world? And I started asking that question um, at the very end of 2011 started asking that question, like, what does the world want from me, not what do I want from the world? And the answer started coming in, like, build, build this platform. Not saying, like, it come, came in, in English kind of thing, saying, build this platform. Like that. <laughs> the voice but, of God. <laughs> yeah. Taylor. Um, and we're going to call it Change Heroes. Uh, that did not happen. You know, but the feeling, what resonated with me the most, I'd be, I would think about, okay, well, what if I build this platform that can enable charities to raise exorbitant amounts of money in a really small amount of time? Was that my, you know, is that my highest and best use to the world? And I decided that three years ago that it was. And I touch in all the time with like, what is my highest and best use? And if that changes, I will change what I'm doing. But it hasn't changed for the last three years. Um, and I don't foresee it changing anytime soon uh, because what we're doing I, I truly believe is 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 changing the face of fundraising. It's getting more people involved uh, in in philanthropic initiatives. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ahead of when they usually would. You know, Dominic, you, typically a guy like yourself, if we're looking at statistics, won't really get involved in philanthropic stuff heavily until you're fifty-five. Uh, that's what the stats say because that's when you start getting time. Because you're busy, right? You got stuff on go. I don't know if you've got a pug yet or a French bulldog, but lots of people do. Chocolate Labrador. <laughs> Um, and, and you get a girlfriend and blah, 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 and we make excuses of why we're so busy, yet it's the prime of our freaking life. It's the prime of when we were the smartest, we're the sharpest, we've got like the resources. This is the time that I think people should be getting involved in giving. And, um, and so, yeah, so that, that's all stemmed from your question of, of, of practice and meditation practice. So the contrast is back then looking at what do I want? What's, what do I think is going to make me happy? And the next one being like, you know, take me out of it. What does the world want? And it's ridiculous. The, the byproduct of that is just pure happiness. You know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're doing everything that you think the universe wants you to do, it's pretty impossible to not be, you know, pretty ecstatic with your life. Though stressful at times, obviously, as well. Do you have any mantras that you repeat that uh, um, you can share? Maybe, I, I guess, I, when I wake up in the morning, I make sure that the first word out of my mouth is love. Mm. Um, you know, no matter what, no matter if I'm sleeping by myself or if I've got a girlfriend or whatever, um, just make sure the word is love to kind of start the day in that fashion. Um, sometimes, sometimes, a, like, a, like a mantra is if I find that I'm getting nervous, if I find that I'm in the state of being reactionary, um, then I'll put my, I'll say pure positive mindset. I'll be like, PBM, pure positive mindset. You know, anything I say, I'm going to turn it into 
you know, just like really focusing on what, what it is that, and when I say what I want, I'm, you know, kind of trying to reiterate what I've been told that I'm supposed to do, if that makes sense, uh, and putting it into a tangible goal. Because it's not like the universe can be like, you should raise $10 million for free the children by the end of the year. You know, it's basically saying, you know, but I think to the most, that's actually, that is my goal, is to raise, 10, is to raise the free the children $10 million by the end of the year so that it can, you know, it would, would impact tens of thousands of people. Um, uh, so yeah, so I guess I'm on trying to switch my mindset into something positive, and I guess technically I have a primordial sound meditation mantra that I will sometimes use in meditation, where you kind of like, it's a word in, in Sanskrit um, that I repeat over and over again in my head if I'm meditating on mantra. Mm. What's your burning desire? Uh, loaded question. Um, Let's see here. What is um, you know what? My burning desire at this moment is are the goals that I have in my head, uh, which which translate to funding uh, free the children, translate to um, getting very heavily involved in funding the. The efforts on the ground with what's happening in West Africa, the Ebola outbreak, and uh, and so right now in my yeah in my head I guess my mantra is those goals of what I want to raise for the children and what, what what I want us to raise for for the efforts on the ground in West Africa, and at the same time you know building a white label version of Change Hero. This is what we've been working on for the last year, so that almost any nonprofit can use it. Mm. Uh, we've been testing it on libraries and like I said before, water projects and scholarships and community centers and stuff like that. And, and it's working across all of these causes. So um, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't necessarily have one burning desire that has a ton of, you know, um, the, you know, a ton of fluff around it. Aside from, I just repeat what my goal is. Like every in my head, it's like all the time. This is what I want to do. So I want to do by, by December thirty first, this much raised. By December thirty first, this much raised for this organization. This much for this organization. And, and focus on it, and at the same time with the, you know, with the meditation practice, obviously trying to like let it go at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. What's your burning desire, Dominic? <laughs> My burning desire? Uh, at this point, it is really to create an abundance for my family. Um, my folks have had some hardship over the last few years with my dad's cancer, and, um, and the financial downturn and I want to create the ability to have them at this stage in their life, almost 70 years old. I want the abundance to be able to help them be able to step back. Mm -hmm. And this project that I'm working on with you right now is a big portion of what I want to create right now because I have found over the last couple of years um, bringing inspiration to people is something that brings me a lot of fulfillment. And I feel like if I can share the most inspiring people in my life with others, um, they too can be inspired and they can change the world in a way that I can't um, if, sure. if I were to reach one by one by one. Yeah. If I can do this on a larger scale, this is, this is what I want to do and what I want to create with this project. So, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm so happy to have been a part of it, man. Thank you so much for... You. I was part of your burning desire. That's really yeah, you are. Amazing. Thank you very, yeah. very much. Cool. Well, thank you. I look forward to the next time we talk, and I, uh, I really appreciate you spending the time with me. Um, before we go, where is the best location for people who want to connect with you and with Change Heroes? Where can they go? You know what? Like, to be honest, I, it's funny you say that too. Because I was just thinking about interviews and about radio interviews and stuff like that. And at the end, they're like, so to learn more about Change Heroes, where does someone go? And I'm always like, changeheroes.com. And I'm like, you know what, that's so cliche. How's this? If you want to do something, if you want to build a school or fund a water project or, let's say, build a house in one of the 19 um, Latin American countries that we're, we're about to start building houses uh, or funding houses for from our advice communities, mm -hmm. email me. My name's Taylor, <laughs> and I will answer email me taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R, at changeheroes.com. Awesome. And, and the reason I say that is because yesterday, I made this social, social media post yesterday. 
about this guy, his name's Eduardo, and he, Eduardo emailed me uh, probably, it's got to be a year and a half ago, and said, hey, uh, I'd like to build a school, uh, I work at J.P. Morgan, and, or Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, I think, um, and, and I think I want to leave my job and build, build a school and then go to Africa, and I was like, that sounds amazing, do it, and so I said, hell yeah, leave your job, that place sucks, <laughs> And he's like, he's like, okay. So he funded a school. He raised ten thousand dollars in a day, in a friggin' day. Mm. It's a lot like you actually done it. You would do it in a day too, by the way. <laughs> Challenge. Um, so he he raised ten thousand dollars in a day. He ended up raising twenty five thousand dollars in a week. He then went to Africa, volunteered at a couple of schools, then moved back to his home country of Chile. He was from New York. Moved back to his home country of Chile. So Taylor and, and he, by the way, he translated all of our pages into Spanish for his Spanish. Wow. He translated our video into Spanish. Then he's now pioneered a partnership between us and a Latin American nonprofit that will give us access to 19 different Central and South American um, countries. Wow. Uh, and so I said to him, I said, dude, you're so involved. Why don't you come on as like an official advisor and investor in Change Heroes? You know, and he's like, absolutely, I'm in. He just deposited his money maybe Friday, so four days ago. And so now from an email, this guy has raised enough money to build a school, or sorry, two and a half schools technically. Mm -hmm. He's pioneered a partnership in Latin America that will give us access to you know hundreds and hundreds of more thousands of people. And now he's working with me kind of hand in hand. So the, the power of a personal email to me is, is exponential. And I'm guessing that the people that, you know, that listen to your podcast are relatively smart people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've never ever said that in, in an interview before, but I mean it. Email me, let's talk, we'll do some ridiculous things. But be warned, if you email me, I will hold you to what you say. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your time and appreciate what you're doing and acknowledge you for all the awesome change that you are bringing to this world. And thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Thanks, brother. Well, there you have it, Shifters, a guy who has built not only a successful real estate practice, but someone who is now literally being the change he wants to see in the world. Thank you, Taylor Conroy, for sharing your story with us. If you have a cause that you believe in, whether it be funding a school or bringing clean water to a community, Taylor is the man to connect with. I know I feel inspired by the work he and his team are doing. Next week, I'm back here with another enlightening episode as I sit down to talk with another very good friend of mine, Sean Peterson. Sean is a Los Angeles architect whose frustration with the city's building restrictions and regulations led him to innovate an incredible service through a tech startup, saving hours of time and headache in his daily business practice and the practice of other community professionals. Until then, shifters, keep it real.